I think one of the toughest challenges was how do you define and bound this ecosystem that is so diverse and moving so quickly? And I think this is not just an issue for any research on DAOs. It's really an issue across Web3. And the solution we ultimately came up with, a bit of a Band-Aid fix, but I think as best as we could do is we want to come up with a definition that's broad enough to encompass what's going on in the space and as well as specific enough to really speak to what makes a DAO a DAO. And so what we landed on was this. DAOs are entities that use blockchains, digital assets, and related technologies to do three things. One, to direct resources. Two, to organize activities. And three, to make decisions in a decentralized fashion. Welcome to Tech Intersect. I'm your host, Tanya Evans, and my life and work exist at the heart of law, business, and technology. Yeah, I've earned a few fancy titles and degrees over the years, but the bottom line is I'm a writer, speaker, teacher, and lifelong learner. And I'm really excited that you've joined me on this journey. So what is Tech Intersect? Well, it's authentic, empowering conversations with really interesting guests who demystify complex topics to prepare you for the future, because your future is now. And it exists where law, business, and tech intersect. Get ready to listen, learn, and leverage. Let's get started. In this episode of Tech Intersect, I am really, really excited to finally welcome Aiden Slavin to the show. Aiden is the project lead of the World Economic Forum's Crypto Impact and Sustainability Accelerator. And at the forum, he leads initiatives across the public and private sectors to advance the Web3 policy and impact agenda. Prior to the World Economic Forum, he led policy and partnerships programs at ID2020. It's an alliance focused on realizing the benefits of blockchain-based digital identity. And he holds a BA from Columbia University and an MSc from the University of Oxford. And I invited him on Tech Intersect to talk about this recent project that I had the great fortune to work on and to contribute to the WEF and Wharton Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO, toolkit. And also some reflection on DAOs from the recent news. Recently, I believe in February, there was a lawsuit against a DAO that raised questions about the legal status of the systems. So we will talk about all of that and more in a moment. But first, Aiden, welcome. Thank you so much, Tanya. I am beyond excited to be on this. Glad that we're finally getting the chance to connect and just glad to have the opportunity to share the work that we've been doing with this great community at the forum. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure to participate. And I loved all of the diversity of thought leaders really in the space, critically looking at all of the potential and actual legal consequences of this type of organizational structure, which really raises a wide range of potential legal issues. And we had our little subcommittees working on various parts, but you were charged with the task of bringing it all together in a coherent singular voice. So first, even just talk about the road that led up to the decision to create a DAO toolkit. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for that intro and that opportunity. So I will back up and I'll talk for a moment about the DAO project series as a whole, and then I will jump into the DAO toolkit and the origin story there. So the DAO project series came out of this really interesting accelerator program that I have the good fortune of participating in as the project lead. And, you know, the aim here was really to investigate the value of these new organizations that are really trying to change the game of how communities and individuals organize with each other, both online and offline. We had been seeing in 2021 the DAO space really explode. We included this figure in the report, but I think in 2021 alone, DAO treasuries grew by a factor of 40 into the $16 billion some odd range. That scale really interested us. But what was more interesting was the breadth of the use cases that DAOs were being applied to. So, of course, there are financial DAOs, there are DAOs that are being used in the philanthropic space, but there were also a number of grassroots community DAOs that were also spinning up around that time. And so our steering committee at the forum that sets our mandate said, decentralized organizations are really a a world we want to double click on. And so we ended up standing up the DAO project series. We had a great partner in this work in the Wharton Blockchain Digital Asset Project, which is led by Professor Kevin Werbach. And we started this series by really building a a community. So as you mentioned, Tanya, in this very DAO-like way, we wanted to bring in a community of experts to do this work rather than just doing it in a top-down fashion. 
So we built a community of legal experts, DAO builders, social impact entrepreneurs that were looking at DAOs for that context, brought them all together, divided them up into these four working groups, and actually set them working first on something called DAOs Beyond the Hype, which was the forum's kind of 101 paper. And it launched last June at our Global Technology Summit in SF. And that piece of work led the community to say, you know, we've done a good job, I think, covering the 101 high level, what DAOs are, how they differ from corporations and things like that. But we want to double click on what are some of the major issues that DAOs confront? What are their barriers to scale? And those are legal and regulatory in nature, they're operational, they're governance issues. And then what are some strategies that DAOs can employ to try and overcome some of those challenges? So that was the origin story of the DAO toolkit and how that all came to be. It's really important work because so often and necessarily so we are focused on the initial disruptive impact of distributed ledgers and crypto assets. And that was in the financial sector. So thinking about Bitcoin and and the subsequent progeny as well, and the development of various types of programmable money, all the way from the OGs to privacy coins to stable coins, central bank digital currencies is all the not so rage, the rage, but not so rage. Um, There's just a lot of conversation going on about that first use case, but there's so many other things. In fact, as I was reflecting on your bio, even focusing on identity, which I find to be one of the most exciting exciting areas. And then this one, of course, the decentralized organization, kind of the flat level community ground up building. Mm -hmm. One of the many reasons Bitcoin was created in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. And I backed into the Web3 space. I did not start my career thinking I was going to go into blockchain and the financial use cases were very much same. (laughs) Right. Not what excited me. What excited me was this decentralizing impulse, the ability to create systems of greater accessibility, equity, and empowerment for individuals. That was really why I got into the blockchain-based identity space, where I spent about five years before coming to the forum. And it's also why I found DAOs so interesting. Because, you know, as you say, I think in theory, at least, and we see some interesting nuance when you actually double click on DAOs in terms of how decentralized they are. But in theory, they are trying to build this new community-based internet native form of organizing. And that to me is really exciting, more for its social implications necessarily than for its financial applications, though I think there's some exciting development work going on there as well. Absolutely. You know, let's level set from an educational point of view to even explain at a high level someone who may not be in the space. I have a lot of listeners that come from all different aspects and may not know what the heck a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO even is. So let's take a step back and have you explain that. Yes, absolutely. So I will share that this was one of the toughest things. Uh, I think <laughs> I'm glad I'm asking you instead of having to do it myself. On this. Yeah, I mean, I know we worked on this in many, many discussions we had in the working group, but I think one of the toughest challenges was how do you define and bound this ecosystem that is so diverse and moving so quickly. And I think this is not just an issue for any research on DAOs. It's really an issue across Web3. And the solution we ultimately came up with, a bit of a Band-Aid fix, but I think it's best <laughs> we could do is we want to come up with a definition that's broad enough to encompass what's going on in the space and as well as specific enough to really speak to what makes a DAO a DAO. And so what we landed on was this. DAOs are entities that use blockchains, digital assets, and related technologies to do three things. One, to direct resources, two, to organize activities, and three, to make decisions in a decentralized fashion. And so to jump into what some examples of that might look like, directing resources, I think, is the most commonly known use case for DAOs, I think it's fair to say. And that is a a way in which communities come together and they use this internet native type of organizing structure to pool resources and then collectively decide where to allocate those. Those could go to public goods projects, as in the case of a DAO like Gitcoin, or they could go to fund the development of a a software application or an application in DeFi. Organizing activities. So we've seen also DAOs come together and organize around specific activities that communities want to go and do. A small, you know, a simple example there is Friends with Benefits DAO, which brings people together in person for these community events. And third, make decisions. This is the broadest use for a DAO, but I think it is in some ways, the most revolutionary one, because it's about how do you create a format for people to come together 
in a decentralized way. They could be participating in any time zone anywhere in the world, right. using a governance token to cast a vote on a decision about a choice that they felt strongly about. So these are the three activities that we saw DAOs doing most commonly. You love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe you want to build a brand, grow your business, or are looking for an excuse to talk about your favorite hobby. Whatever your reason for making a podcast, Buzzsprout is the place to start. Since 2009, Buzzsprout has helped over 300,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout walks you step-by-step -step through the whole process and will give you powerful tools to start, grow, and monetize your podcast. Ready to get started? Click the link in the show notes to get our free step-by-step -step guide to starting your podcast today. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it makes me also reflect on the time that I served as the chair of the Maker Ecosystem Growth Foundation, or, or MEGF, which was responsible for the full decentralization of the Maker DAO. And it was really trial by fire to understand the intricacies and the complexities at that level. But not all DAOs function at that level of complexity when you think of all of the smart contracts that go in to enable some really, really interesting ways to leverage crypto assets and really be your own bank. When you think about going bankless, but then I think of other areas, maybe like the Constitution DAO, there are a lot of different things that go forward that can be used for infinite purposes. Purposes, but I love how you distill it to these three basic areas. And I think that makes a lot of sense. When you think about some of the legal issues that the committee as a whole and subcommittees had to tackle and kind of make sense of for purposes of the toolkit, what were some of the biggest things that, that you came across? Yeah. So there were so many um, <laughs> legal issues, as, as you are more aware than I, but our, <laughs> our legal working group, they really came together and Professor Kevin Werbach of Wharton did an excellent job leading that group and trying to distill the many areas of law and regulation that DAOs force a really interesting and potentially productive re-examination of. So you have issues, some issues that are, you know, close to my heart and my experience, issues like know your customer requirements, due mm -hmm. diligence requirements, these onboarding requirements that are very important for maintaining security and fraud prevention in the traditional financial system but that are also responsible for a lot of exclusionary practices. Right. We see many of those foundational issues that are really a problem across many parts of Web3. We see them playing out also in a DAO's context. So for DAOs that are managing financial assets, how do they do KYC for contributors that are coming on and participating? One of the questions that that legal issues group was focused on. Some other really interesting and nerdy topics there were taxation. So you know, how do DAOs pay taxes? We had some great tax experts that were coming in and speaking there. But I would say that the biggest issue that we saw DAOs most commonly approaching from a legal standpoint was around the entity structure, the legal mm -hmm. structure that they either did or did not want to adopt in order to gain access to benefits that corporations enjoy, things like limited liability, for instance. And so our legal issues group did a an informal survey, I would say, looking across several DAOs and uncovered some really interesting practices. So there were DAOs that were adopting formal entity structures or, or wrappers to define their legal treatment. There were DAOs that were using more bespoke legislative frameworks that offer DAOs this alternative path to recognition. Some interesting, exciting news there in Utah, just from, I believe, a, a few weeks ago. But each legal wrapper we found, and we go through this in the paper, has its own sort of benefits and drawbacks. And so definitely we weren't trying to provide legal advice to the entire DAO ecosystem, but we were trying to raise, as you suggest, some of the major considerations for DAOs. Hi, I'm Dr. Tanya M. Evans, author of Digital Money Demystified. And I want to let you know that to stay on the leading edge of any opportunity, especially investing, you have to empower yourself with the tools and resources needed to keep your knowledge and skills current. And if you're relying on last year's information or even last month's, look, you're already behind. Sure, you can try to figure this out on your own at YouTube University. The problem is it's difficult to separate fact from fiction with so many carnival barkers banking on your inexperience. And of course, there are the naysayers, usually from legacy finance, banking on your fear while they 
quietly help their high net worth clients to invest. All of it muddies the waters when all you want to know is how to get in safely, legally, and competently so you're not left behind. That's why I wrote Digital Money Demystified, where I take the top 10 crypto myths head on and give you well-researched, well-supported facts to empower you to make good choices out there in the new digital cash economy. As a law professor who developed the first blockchain crypto and law online certificate program, a retail and corporate crypto policy and education trainer, and a thought leader appearing regularly on national media, I've done the heavy lifting so you don't have to. Look, there are plenty of books and courses on which crypto assets to invest in. Digital Money Demystified is the book you read before you dive into those. So head to digitalmoneydemystified.com to learn more and prepare for the future of money and wealth today. This is also very important because so many in the space, particularly early on, and it makes me think of like the initial coin offering boom and bust days where the technology in and of itself is agnostic. It's a tool that can be used, but when there may be the intention or the misunderstanding of using it as an alternative, like an extra legal outside of the laws and the legal system. And you're just going to always run up against the fact that this technology is not developed in a vacuum. Yeah. And oftentimes this technology is disrupting heavily regulated industries. Yeah. And so the reality also is that many of the 20th century laws are not a neat fit. Usually laws lag behind and intentionally so that's the way from a deliberative process to kind of look through and evaluate and spend enough time analyzing so that you can craft laws that will endure and don't have to be changed every 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes it really difficult for a space like this that changes every 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> but people really get jammed up creating something, getting really excited about the technology and then running afoul of a host of legal issues. And that's why I think the toolkit is so helpful to at least get on the radar for those who are building in the space, some of the legal issues and concerns that they have to go and see a lawyer about someone who is well-versed in this particular ecosystem. Absolutely. No, I could not agree more with that point. And I will share that that was also one of the impetuses behind why we wanted to put the toolkit together in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, Forum, as the organization for public-private cooperation, we really want to be using our great, you know, the industry expertise and knowledge from the innovator communities we bring together to bring some of those challenging topics up to our policy maker, government official, regulator audiences. And so one exciting piece of work that we did when we were putting together this toolkit is to convene a series of roundtables with policymakers and regulators all around the world that either had never thought about what DAOs are and what law and policy should look like around them, or that had been thinking about it for a considerable amount of time. And so our hope is that resources like this can help not provide a prescriptive response, which we right. really think up to policymakers and their constituencies, but at least flag the major considerations and help provide a structured process those decision makers can follow to build fit for purpose policy around these organizations. Absolutely, because policy is going to drive the laws, the rules of the road and engagement. And it's never an either or, but a both and to make sure right. that collectively policymakers, regulators, regulated parties, consumers, investors, builders, we all need to operate with at least a baseline set of facts and then to be able to make more informed decisions in my little panacea yeah. world that I live in. Right. <laughs> I love that. And you're making me think if I could just share one interesting reflection that flipped a switch for me as we were doing this work around DAO governance, the types of governance issues that DAOs run into, some of them are technical in nature and unique to Web3. Most of them are old challenges of democratic governance that have been around for centuries. And I think in an ironic way, there is a way in which the DAO community has needed to innovate around some really old problems. Mm. The policymakers, I think, are still, you know, in some cases, banging their head against the wall, trying to come up with solutions to. And so I think there's actually a lot shared between the policymaker community and the community of DAO builders that are trying to address these very old governance challenges around voter apathy and tragedy of the commons and 
these were some of those really common foundational Absolutely. issues we found in the research. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I'd not thought of it that way. And I think what's old is new. Yeah. Right? As in the, the human condition, as we continue to evolve, we mm -hmm. are still faced with some of the same issues and concerns as we become increasingly more globalized. Yeah. Then it presses the point even more. It's a little bit easier. There were still challenges. The tragedy of the commons is a great example in a little agrarian town. Yeah. And then we extrapolate out to the whole world and really realize that we are inextricably linked and mm -hmm. interdependent. And if we use this technology in a way to create more inclusion, more access, more opportunity from the ground up, now many systems are not built from the ground up. So yeah. I think that challenges those in power who would have it stay that way. Mm -hmm. And it does make me think about if policies, and now I'm thinking more broadly of the regulatory uncertainty in yeah. the United States in particular now, that when you are disrupting and challenging power it does not go away quietly or lightly. Um, did you find yourself looking at various lawsuits now against DAOs that may bring that to light as well? Yeah, we absolutely did. And, you know, it was really interesting timing because right around the launch of the toolkit was when the B0X complaint was filed. All of the allegations came out of the CFTC. And we really saw uh, the Commodities Future Trading Commission. We really saw it or we had seen, you know, lawsuits against DAOs, you know, in the past. But mm -hmm. in that one, it was very interesting because we saw some dissenting opinions from both within the CFTC and across the industry that I thought got mm -hmm. it. One of the fundamental challenges, which is how do you assign liability in a decentralized community-based organization? And there were complaints against B0X that could have had the result of a really broad interpretation of where liability lies across a DAO and in a way that could really stymie some positive innovation in the space. And so there is really a need for continuing to closely track how lawsuits are developing, because like in many parts of Web3, that litigation work is going to be likely very uh, impactful in influencing policy development. So mm -hmm. we are tracking that very closely. Its timing, unfortunately, came a bit after the toolkit, so we weren't able to incorporate a full analysis that we did incorporate right. some, but we're continuing to look at those stories as they evolve. Yeah, I suspect that we'll continue to see more and more as the regulatory heat is, uh, on, on the one hand, regulatory heat, and then on the other hand, various states, some states are quite friendly and yes. trying to create opportunities and ways to encourage innovation while still certainly protecting consumers. And then you have states that are not so enthusiastic as well. And we usually see federal policy lag behind to see kind of read the tea leaves of the states and, and ultimately there's some tipping point. They don't always agree, but a lot of times that's what we see. And right now it seems very unsettled. Have you found yeah. that at the state level? A hundred percent. I think the DAOs are a, a great sort of paradigmatic case of there's a lot of innovation in, in the policy realm happening at the state level. And we can look back at Wyoming. A number of our community members were involved in the creation of the, you know, the Wyoming DAO LLC law. Tennessee, you know, Utah very recently, there's a lot of state based efforts here in the US. And it seems that locally, a lot of states are driving forward with DAO recognition laws of one form or another. Mm -hmm. Whereas federally, we have seen some proposals uh, at the national level that have included reference to DAOs like Lumis Gillibrand, and we published some analysis mm -hmm. around that. But yeah, we have not seen as much as I think the community would have liked to just in terms of getting the importance of getting that regulatory clarity to be able to really innovate with confidence. Mm -hmm. How do you compare this to how other countries are approaching the topic? Because you yeah. have a great window to not just what's going on in the United States, but comparatively in other jurisdictions. It is so fascinating, you know, and I will share that we had just a few months ago at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting at Davos, we had a number of countries represented speaking on a, a wide variety of Web3 topics. And DAOs actually came up a number of times. So we had a minister from Finland who had spoken to the importance of creating policy and regulation around DAOs in order to create that enabling environment. We've seen developments like development of purpose-built ministries in jurisdictions like Japan around Web3. We've seen certain jurisdictions really moving quickly to try mm -hmm. and build policy and get to that clarity around Web3 topics. DAOs included. And I think that I suspect we are going to see that only increase 
as countries begin to compete for innovator communities, for new economies that are going to be coming out of innovations like DAO. So I think we will likely continue to see that in the coming months. And so to that end, what's on the horizon for you and for WEF and continuing to develop policy, white papers, toolkits in the future? So I'm really excited about what's next up for this DAO series. We are going to be double clicking on one use case in particular, and that is impact DAOs. The reasons we started this to go back to the beginning of our conversation, it was about shining a light on not just the financial use cases for DAOs, but also some of those more pro-social uses that DAOs can be put towards. So myself and the team, we have been conducting a series of interviews with some of the leading impact DAOs in the space. And we're going to be publishing a series of case studies, really just trying to tell the story of how DAOs are being leveraged for pro-social ends. That should launch in the late summer, early fall. And I would invite you and your listeners, if you have recommendations on great projects that we should be in touch with, to please reach out. Well, my tech intersecies are really great at that, and I will include all of this information in the show notes as well. I'm really excited about that next step in the series. I think it's a critical one, and it reminds people that this is, isn't just an area of wild speculation for capital assets, but really for the transformative power of inclusion and an access for people to have a voice in the future of work and wealth, creativity, innovation. And I think that really does live at the heart, ethos and spirit of, of DAOs. Completely agree. Yeah, could not agree more. Excellent. All right, Aiden Slavin, we appreciate you very much. Keep going and I'll see you back in those Twitter streets. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to the Tech Intersect podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you love it, please tell the world. If not, go ahead and tell me. And in either case, drop a comment or ping me on social media at IPProfEvans with the hashtag Tech Intersect. And finally, a quick reminder on digital safety. There are a lot of scammers out there impersonating me and others, and I need your help. Now hear this. And remember, I will never slide into your DMs to say peace and blessings or hey, and I will never reach out to solicit your time or your money on social media like ever. I'm not a trader. I am an educator and an attorney licensed in four states. Thank you very much. I'm here to inform, inspire, and empower. No cap and definitely no forex. So be careful, make good choices. And remember, I developed an entire free masterclass about the topic of digital safety in the crypto space. So check out secureyourcryptobag.com for more information. That's secureyourcryptobag.com. All right, that's all for this episode. Until next time, continue to shine.